one of the recurring misconceptions about existentialism that it's a dark, brooding, navel-gazing philosophy. Uh, it's, it's not at all. The idea is when you confront death and face death, you, you awaken to the fact that life is not a dress rehearsal, that this is the only life you have. And, and confronting finitude, facing anxiety, injects a measure of intensity and urgency and vitality into our existence that otherwise it wouldn't have. And this is why Nietzsche calls his philosophy a gay science. It's a happy philosophy. It's not a morbid philosophy. It's, it's a joyful philosophy. And Kierkegaard will say the same thing, right? That, that when you confront death, it, it, it uh, opens us up to how precious and poignant and fragile every moment is because it can be snatched away from us at any time. And so in, in many ways, existentialism, at least for me, is the most life affirming of all philosophies. It's not a death focused philosophy at all. It's, it's, it's reminding us of how precious each moment is and that we can't take any day for granted. Now I jumped straight into existential philosophies and I am not as familiar with other philosophies. So how would you distinguish between what differentiates existential philosophies from other philosophies? Well, I mean, just in terms of academic specialties in Anglo-American philosophy, existentialism is completely marginalized uh, because it doesn't focus on the core issues of truth and knowledge and the nature of reality and, and what is the best, what is good conduct, what ought we to do. Existentialism doesn't care about any of that generally because uh, the concern is not on philosophical abstractions. What is the nature of beauty, truth, justice, the good life? Well, actually that's not true. They're concerned with the good life. The existentialist is concerned with what does it mean to be human? What is existence? And so what the existentialists do is they shift the philosophical orientation away from theoretical detachment, where we theorize about abstract forms and turn our attention to the concrete flesh and blood particulars of everyday life, which is what existence en engages or involve, is involved in. And so, uh, it's a, complete, it's a complete reversal of the traditional philosophical orientation that we inherit from Plato and Aristotle and that, that gets uh, refined and consolidated with figures like Descartes and Kant. It, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a philosophy rooted in theoretical reflection. It's a philosophy rooted in attentiveness to the concreteness of our existence, of our being. And that means it focuses on uh, the way we live every day, the moods we feel, the affective experiences that shape us and, and shock us into awareness, like those anxiety moods or nausea moods. And so um, uh, it's always been a kind of peripheral fringe philosophy in uh, the UK and the United States, obviously less so in uh, the golden age of uh, French philosophy and German philosophy in the 20s and 30s and, and teens. But um, thankfully that's starting to change. And one of the drivers of this change is a recognition that because existentialism focuses on concrete existence, it can expand the philosophical uh, perspective to include voices that have been traditionally marginalized in the philosophical mainstream. So feminist philosophy, of course, was, was in many ways inaugurated by Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, critical race theory had a, was deeply impacted by Franz Fanon, who was a student of, of Sartre's and, and, and Beauvoir's and was influenced by Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And so these, these other forms of uh, philosophical approach uh, that have never had a voice at the table are finally being seen as bona fide philosophical perspectives that in my view are in many ways indebted to existentialism by focusing on the concrete and the particular instead of 
abstract universal forms or essences. I know this is me speaking from a completely biased perspective, but I, hearing you say that, it makes me find it hard to imagine why other philosophies have the ability to matter if we haven't understood who it, what it is to be ourselves. If we haven't understood the kind of existential aspect of existence, why does any, what, why does it matter what's right or wrong if we don't know what we are? I yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I find most of uh, Anglophone philosophy quite boring and uninteresting because of that. And as a teacher, the classes that excite the students and engage the students and inspire the students are existentially themed courses because they're at that stage in life where they're asking those questions. What am I doing? What is it about? Why, I, why am I majoring in this and not in that? And how is this gonna shape the, the future of my life? And so when we start talking about Friedrich Nietzsche or Martin Heidegger or Jean-Paul Sartre, the students resonate to these questions because they're feeling them right now at age 18, 19, 20, 21. And they're gonna to have to confront those really serious concerns. They're not, they're not so uh, passionate about abstract metaphysical speculation. Those are interesting and curious thought puzzles, um, but they're curious in the same way that I'm curious about getting good at chess mm -hmm. or, or, or figuring out the New York Times crossword puzzle. Those thought experiments or philosophical curiosities don't keep me up at night. They don't wake me up at 3 a.m. where I'm jolted awake and I think, what's the meaning of my life? That's existentialism. <laughs> <You see? laughs>